Andrea Orcel, thank you so much for speaking to us on Bloomberg. You've had two years as head of Unicredit. How would you summarize that time? Thank you, Francine. Well, how do I summarize it? A uh, few words, transformation, excitement, uh, humbling experience, impressed. Uh, I expected a lot, and uh, I think I was probably more positive than most, but uh, what came to pass, much more than I expected. This was a bank that uh, have lost confidence in itself, have lost its external credibility, that uh, very few, if any, thought could be turned around. And, uh, and it did. And I think that for me it was like a call to arms because when I see something that, is, uh, that people tell me it's impossible, too many challenges, it's broken. I see possible opportunity, potential. So the first part was just convincing everybody that that was possible. And we did do it from day one. Actually, we did do it from before day one. Before I joined, I started talking to people. And uh, we started articulating a vision for the bank, a strategy, a plan. We gelled everybody around principles, culture, and we started trusting and working with each other a lot. And you can see that in two years, the transformation from an industrial standpoint, block by block, we recompose something completely different. And we've done that while delivering financial results. That eventually brought back confidence of the people internally, credibility for the organization outside. And I think a lot of momentum going in the next few years. So what is, are you happy with the share price now? I mean, you've given a lot back also to shareholders. You're kind of you know, raised as one of the successes in European banking right now. Well, what I focus on is delivery. And I think if I look at the transformation of a bank and what we have achieved, uh, redefining the model, redefining what we stand for, who we are, uh, delivering the financial part of it, which is result, we almost multiplied our previous run rate by four times. And uh, our profitability is one of the highest in Europe, our operational efficiency, one of the highest capital efficiency, one of the highest, we're growing. And we've done all of that while continuing to build lines of defense for the future, continuing to invest. So I cannot not be happy. And uh, I think this is, I take the opportunity for thanking the people at Unicredit because they put all their heart into it and have done much more than I ever expected. Share price will follow. You've also had to cut a lot of jobs. I mean, I think uh, around 10,000 overall. How's morale? Well, look, I, I think uh, we need a change. Uh, if you look at where Unicredit was when we started, we were uh, considered a laggard of Europe in the sector. So a change was needed. And when you go to, through this extent of transformation, there are some decisions that are disruptive. So yes, we reduce costs, we improve efficiency. But firstly, it was necessary. And I think uh, it wouldn't have been fair to the people at Unicredit or the people that work with Unicredit had we not done what we have done. Secondly, our efficiency measures were a way to unleash or, or de-block or unlock mm -hmm. the organization. We were very, very heavy at the center, heavy bureaucracy, heavy administration, uh, completely labyrinthian processes, an organization that did not know how to work with each other. And uh, we had constrained all the commercial activity and all the client-facing activity. And we had the arrogance to drive from top down how we should do things. And what we did was to flip the entire model, put the client truly at the center, use the points of context with the client to tell us what the client needed, and then go up the organization and reorganize ourselves in a way that we could be faster, more effective, and most importantly, empower the people close to the decision, albeit within a framework, but they can take the choices. I mean, I come from Germany and I was there yesterday, and this empowerment where we brought back the decision making there, completely transformed the profile of what they're doing, and we're gonna do great this next year as well. So yes, difficult decisions, but I do think that um, when you're in the job that I have, uh, everybody expects you to take them. 
and uh, I also do believe that nobody, well, not everyone is going to agree with you all the time, but most people will also tell you that I prefer a decision right. that I disagree with to no decision at all. And I think uh, what we have delivered and what the people have delivered proves us right. Andrea, what was the hardest part of actually that? Was it convincing people that this was the right strategy? Was it you know, changing the culture? So I, I do think that uh, the, the hardest thing was firstly to convince everybody that we were an organization with enormous potential. That the, it was going to work. And that it was going to work. And it was particularly difficult for two things. One, our performance had been lagging for years. And the second thing was that we have a business model that is unlike anybody else. So usually in banks you look at leaders in a market, you look at leaders in a market with a great global business. Is it an investment bank or wealth management? In our case, we're not that. We are a federation of 13 banks across countries and economies that are trying to converge but haven't converged altogether yet. We're waiting for that European project. And uh, how do you define something from there that makes sense for everybody and that extract value? And that was our most important point and we have did that. I think today people talk about we're pan-European and people talk about what that means internally. Uh, the second thing was um, to reignite the passion, and I think it was the most important. So behind that vision and the strategy that goes with it, reignite the passion and the drive and the belief of people. And you know, throughout my f uh, career, Francine, I've always thought, uh, not everybody agrees with me, but when you spend so much time professionally or at work, you know, life is too short. People want to be in a place where they agree the direction of travel, they understand the vision, they are given the tools to excel, and ultimately they work with people with similar beliefs and they win. Uh, life is too short to be in an organization where you're tagging along or you're losing or you're called a failure, etc. And I think as we started rolling our vision and have everybody piled behind it, and we started winning one yeah. quarter after another, now it's 11, and hopefully there will be 12. Um, there is an energy to the organization that has made the rest a detail. And the rest was just recomposing all the pieces that were there, all the blocks that were there, into something completely different. And today, I think if you, if you looked from the inside at the organization that we are versus what we were, yeah. unrecognizable. And I think that's what not many appreciate because they, they track the results financially, but they do not see the full potential of what we have delivered so far. Andrea, you like winning. Yes. Do you think you've won already for the bank or does the share price have so to I be do where think, you want it? So I do think that um, for me, it's always set a goal that uh, in your mind is excellence and trying to get as close as possible. I think at Unicredit, in a number of ways, uh, we went a lot further. I think the people went a lot further. And uh, notwithstanding fact, we think we can go a lot further still. So I'm more confident than I was three years ago or two and a half years ago about where we can go. You want another term? I do. I've said that uh, you know, with the people I have around of me and uh, their passion and what we think we can achieve, it will be a great journey. If you get another term, do you think it'll be harder than the last term? Because it's, you know, operationally, I'm not saying what you did was easy, but operationally you've changed it. Now you have to grow. Well, I would say different. So the first part is, in a way, you need to rebuild the organization. And for us was client at the center, empowerment, and bring all the things that we could extract economies of scale or scope to the center, the factories, the technology, the data, the culture. So, but that, that is primarily something you do top down. Mm -hmm. You have a view, you have confidence, you listen a lot to the people, you crystallize it, but then you drive it. It's a lot of it is up front, especially the mechanics of it. In the next part, the good news is now we have a winning organization, we have a winning team. We have all the blocks in the right place. 80% of the re-engineering is done. The difficult part is now revving it up right. and uh, bringing to bear all the things we've done yeah. and driving through 
focusing the right way on the right clients with the right services, uh, the next phase. Normally, I would tell you, Francine, a lot, more, a lot harder because it's no longer primarily driving from the center, but it's getting everybody to go towards the same objective. But that's the beauty of it. I am absolutely confident that uh, our team and especially all the people in the network, in the branches, are just waiting to engage. And they are already on run rate to do that. So very different, and yeah. I'm sure I'll learn a lot from this. But given the people that we have, I'm very confident. You also have a lot of cash, actually, that you could use for acquisitions, <laughs> or you know, maybe something transformational. How will you use that cash? Well, look, I, I, think, um, I think for us, M&A transforming. So the first block was really transforming internally. Uh, I mean, you know, there was so much value. There still is so much value. It is true that now that it is clear who we are, what we are, what counts for us, um, getting acquisition to accelerate that path, to strengthen ourselves in a place or in a business or whatever, helps. Uh, and we're very clear on what would do that to us. Um, we also what? have of what would fit but for which, us. But can then, you tell us? No, absolutely not. But the question actually is quite easy. If you look at our strategy, it's easy to see what fits and what doesn't fit. I doubt that if we ever did an acquisition, somebody would look at us and say, that's weird. That's weird. Yeah. So the question is, does it fit from a value creation standpoint? And it's not only about numbers. If you do the wrong acquisition and it doesn't add value, mm -hmm. what we feel we're working for three stakeholders, our investors will not make the value that they think they should get. Our people will fail in the integration because we cannot deliver what we want and our clients are going to be in the middle. So the bottom line is if it's not the right terms, if it's not the right way, it's better not to do it and we still have a ton more to do. It is true, however, Francine, that yes, we do have the cash and yes, now more than ever, we know what we can do. We've shown it on ourselves and if we were to do something, we are extremely confident that we can extract the value from it. What size acquisition are we talking about? I mean, could, could this be a big cross-border? Look, like I think for us what counts is uh, reinforcing where we are. This is still a phase where we have plenty to do in the markets where we are. Mm -hmm. We never exclude anything. You never get what you want at the time you want it. But, but for us, what really counts is strengthening our market position, our client franchises, in certain way, our factories. and. Um, most of the things we look at are within range uh, with the usage of cash alone or very limited shares. But at the moment, as you said before, given at least we believe that the valuation of our shares is well undervalued, uh, cash is better than shares. Is there appetite actually from regulators for something big cross-border in Europe right now? Well, you know, uh, I think regulators um, have been uh, uh, sponsoring and trying to get further pan-European integration. The, the issue has been that without banking union, uh, European integration or European cross-border make very little sense. And I think many of us are saying that. I think it's uh, also an obstacle for the European to cr for the Europe to crystallize all the value because for as long as you don't have pan-European organization, you do not have the financial strands to push the growth that we need to push. For us, it's a little bit different because uh, I can do domestic acquisition or combination in 13 countries. So what many would call cross-border with limited value, we call reinforcement of an, one of our federated countries. So it's different. And therefore, I think that there is ability for us to, especially within our model, to add a lot of value and do what you would call cross-border, we would call domestic. But how big do you want Unicredit to become? Like, if I speak to you in, in four years, will it be a, just a, a different bank because of its size and footprint? Well, I think big is risky because when you start putting big, you start thinking size over the quality and the value that you add. And therefore, I always try not to get there. But let's put it this way. Europe needs banks with market caps ahead of 100 billion. I mean, if we want this, this economic block to be an economic block that can hold 
vis-à-vis -vis the U.S., vis-à-vis -vis China. We need organizations that are bigger in scale or we will not be able to propel it. So for everyone, I think for all my peers, etc., getting to a size that allows us to have the critical mass to support the economic growth is critical. And, and would this also be countering Wall Street? I don't think, I think it's a different approach. I think if we look at Wall Street, they have models where obviously they mostly have their domestic market, mm -hmm. which is enormous, mm -hmm. and then they have global investment banks, global wealth management activities. I think Europe has lost that train, to be honest. Uh, very difficult for us to keep up with, probably very few exceptions. Uh, I think for Europe what it is, or at least for us what it is, is Europe. So can we have organization that can accompany the growth of Europe? In a way, and I tell that to my, co my colleagues, it's a little bit responding for us. The dream is responding to Henry Kissinger question where they said, if I want to talk to about Europe, who do I call? And we would like to be part of that call. And finding a way to drive the convergence of our corporates, drive the convergence of our population with the 13 market becoming stronger, eventually growing into 14, 15, 16. I mean, with a deal with Alpha, we haven't really bought another bank, but we are in a very strong partnership that will create an ecosystem that is broader and we will continue in that direction. What are valuations looking like now? So the, the market is a little bit um, on tender hooks, on interest rates. I guess they worry about defaults. Mainly they're positive, but then you have these kind of, you know, sucking up for air or retrenchments. Is, is now a good time in the next 12 months? Well, in my opinion, it is. I think what we have today, especially in the sector, is for more than a decade, almost 15 years, um, U.S. financial institutions, especially banks, were trading at a big multiple because they were a multiple, a premium multiple because they were profitable, they were growing, they were growing places. European were shrinking, retrenching, dealing with their issues. And therefore, we were the shadow of what the U.S. banks were. Today, uh, the U.S. banks are still very strong. They are going through a little bit of their own issues at the moment. Uh, while the Europeans are resurging because we've moved to a positive interest rate environment, we've moved to a growth on the front foot, we've moved to all of that. But it's almost like the market says, well, hang on, uh, how can it be that in this moment European banks are doing almost as well or better than the US? And there is this um, disconnect between what we are delivering and what we feel is sustainable, and actually in our case, we can build from there further vis-a-vis -vis what people are looking at. And, you know, that's why, you know, if you take Unicredit, you can take consensus or whatever. But we're trading on anywhere between four and five times earnings. I mean, for an organization that delivers distribution of 20%, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite complicated to justify. But what kind of manager do you think you are? Um, I would like to think that um, I listen a lot. I challenge even more. Uh, I am uh, uh, I'm demanding, uh, but I, I do think that uh, more people than less, uh, rather than less, like to work with me because uh, we do achieve great things together and we have a lot of fun in, on the way. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are a lot of things that I learned here. I mean, uh, as I keep on saying, the work of some of the people on the front line at this bank is extraordinary. But, um, but you know, it, it, it has been also reconfirming that you can work, you can be a banker, an M&A banker, you can work uh, in an investment bank, you can work in a commercial bank. In my opinion, you can work anywhere. But certain principle remains always the same. There is a part that we call soft that is critical. It's what gels everything. Getting people excited, getting people aligned, getting people to believe into the same things, have a common culture. Without that, you don't go anywhere. The rest is um, usually we find the answers just by asking people. We just don't do that. But if we dig all the way down, and we go into a branch or we go and ask a client, what is it that you're expecting? We found a lot of answers a lot easier and then we, we appear as having the answer, but actually 
we get them from the organization we work for. So I do think that if you have the, the uh, stamina, the humility, the, the, the determination to do that, um, then the technical part of the equation, which is, as we were talking about, how do you recompose? What is the kind of service I'm going to give? I'll, I'll tell you a short story that I think encapsulated it all probably a month and a half to two when I was, uh, that I had John, I went to a branch in uh, Triveneto in Italy. And there was an elderly lady at the end of my visit that asked to talk to me. And she had banked with us forever. And she started saying that Unicredit had banked with her since she was a little girl. And then she went into, however, your service, this and that and that and that and that. You need to change all of that and how we should do. And I took note and she was happy. And then while I was about to leave, she called me back and she said, and get your share price above 15. I'm an investor. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it kind of does full circle. Uh, there is a lot of overlap between our clients, our communities, our investors, our people. And at the end of the day, in order to win, and if you win, it pulls it together. And at the moment, we are we are living that. What's the um, the thing that worries you the most when you look at, you know, the bank or banking in general, investor appetite for banking stock, but also markets and divisions within societies? There, there's a lot to worry about. Well, frankly. I um, I think what worries the most is uh, I come from a generation that uh, was brought up on. Let's get together, let's get closer, let's understand, let's globalize. Um, sky's the limit, and we can learn from each other. We tolerate each other. And now we seem to be on a path of fracturing, dividing. We don't tolerate each other. Uh, you either agree with me, or we cannot be friends, etc., etc. It's a very divisive uh, direction. Um, and you see it in all the things that are, that, that are occurring. If you look at the last 15, 20 years, we had it, in a way, very good in terms of stability, lack of volatility. Now what do we have? We have lots of volatility shocks. Every time we think we've dealt with the last one, a new one comes on the other thing. And I think as the, the globe starts dividing, we're going to have more and more of that. So morally and for my daughter, at least, I don't like where it's going. Uh, and and uh, certainly, I will personally try to do the most I can to fight that. But for the bank and for my job, it also reminds us that um, the next shock comes from a place we didn't expect and that we cannot manage organization looking back. We need to look forward and really think again and again and again, what are we missing and what is it that where does the next shock can come from? Prepare lines of defense, but most importantly, prepare to adjust and change mm -hmm. uh, if the shock arrives. And our first test was really, we did Unicredit Unlocked in December 21. In, uh, well, you know, a few weeks later, we got the invasion of Ukraine. The entire plan, like all the plans, became obsolete a few weeks later. And you go back and you regroup and you realize that what counts is vision, strategy, direction of travel. We're in it together and we're going there. And then the rest is detail. We recompose the levers, we regroup, and we do exactly the same as before, but in a different way, adjusting for what the shock is. And I think going forward, organization that can adjust, adapt, anticipate um, faster, better, are going to be winning organizations. And for us, that's, that's if there is a challenge for the management team is to be on our front foot on that.